presumptive former Democrat President Joe Biden is laughing off the idea that he needs to take a cognitive test to see if that stuff dribbling out of the side of his mouth could be his brains. Speaking to an imaginary interviewer who had him trapped in a corner of his basement, Biden said, quote, come on, man, I can pass a cognitive test as easily as blueging a falderoon or, you know, that thing, whatever it is that you do whenever you can do something really easily, like passing whatever it is we were just talking about. But maybe I shouldn't have said that. I'll have to ask my wife. Now, why don't you just disappear back into my mind and stop asking me all these questions, unquote. The issue arose after Biden made yet another racial gaffe, this time telling a reporter for NPR that black people all think the same way. Later, Biden issued a correction saying, quote, come on, man. When I said black people all think the same way, I didn't mean they all think the same way. I just meant it was hard for me to tell which one of them was speaking because they all look so much alike, except the ones who won't vote for me because they ain't black. And that tricky way they change color makes me suspect they're up to something. Or maybe that's the Jews. I can't remember because they look pretty similar, too. But the point is, someone is definitely conspiring against me. And when I'm president, believe you me, I'm going to get on my elephant and track them down. Or maybe that's not an elephant. I'm a little confused because I was taking one of those cognitive tests. And boy, oh boy, it was harder than blue a Falderon, unquote. Meanwhile, Biden continues his search for a vice president and has reportedly narrowed the choices down to the communist, the nasty communist and the liar. He promises to choose quickly so people know who they're actually voting for. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. I feel hunky-dunky, life is tickety-boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunky doo Ship-shaped, ipsy-topsy, the world is a bitty zing It's a wonderful day, hurrah, hooray, it makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray. All right, we are back. Blue Gina Falderone. <laughs> what does that even mean, Blue Gina Uh Please go on uh, YouTube or wherever the hell it is, that thing where I have my channel. You know, it's like, uh, come on, man. I don't know. Uh, it's the Andrew Claven channel on YouTube. Subscribe. Leave a comment. And if the comment is even halfway intelligent, it will raise the level of the conversation on this program. And so we'll read it out loud. Today we have one. It's hard to uh, know what this guy's name is or if it is a guy. It's S.J. Maliz, maybe, or Shamaliz M. Uh, it says, I unfortunately mostly died during the Clavenless week. Uh, but that's good news because if mostly peaceful means violent, then you mostly died means you're living the good life. Uh, yesterday, I did something I almost never do, which is I wrote a letter to the editor. I wrote to the Wall Street Journal, which is the last truly major national newspaper in the country since the New York Times, a former newspaper, became a former newspaper. The journal's op-ed page skews right, but their news coverage has traditionally been center-left, pretty much. Now, though, as the young brainwashed woke crowd comes in as staff, the rot of leftism is beginning to spread in their coverage. We know it's there because... Two years ago, then-editor-in-chief Gerard Baker lectured his reportorial staff, telling them to avoid commentary dressed up as news reporting. And last month, nearly 300 news side workers sent an angry letter demanding that op-eds stop disagreeing with settled leftist doctrines. For now, the journal managed to stave off the attack and save what is genuinely an excellent op-ed page. But on Monday, in a story called Portland Protest Turned into Riot, Police Say, This was the second paragraph, and this is kind of typical for the journal nowadays. Nightly protests for racial justice have rocked the city of Portland for over two months since the killing of George Floyd by Minneapolis police, with tensions flaring after President Trump sent in federal agents last month. Every word of this paragraph stinks of leftist rot. Are the Portland demonstrations protests for racial justice? What is racial justice? Is it even a thing? Or is it just a phrase like racial profiling or social justice? It's a bunch of words that sound important put together to mean whatever Marxists think will best spread the poison of Marxism. Did tensions actually flare after the feds went in? And if so, how come the rioting got worse after the feds left? And has it been thoroughly determined that Floyd was killed by the police? Have we had a trial and I missed it? Why shouldn't the sentence just have read, Nightly demonstrations have rocked the city since the death of George Floyd in police custody. As always, it's not that they're lying. It's that they don't know they're lying. 
because their entire language is packed with lies. This may seem a petty complaint, and I know they won't run my letter, but it's really everything. It's everything. I've spent my life writing and rewriting sentences to find the exact words that will convey what I want to say. It's not too much to ask journalists to use simple English to describe facts without the built-in editorializing of the language they learned in leftist colleges. Only the truth will defeat the Marxist movement that is set on ending the American ideal of individual liberty, and you can't tell the truth if you don't know the words. All right, let us talk about Raycon earbuds. I lo- These are wireless earbuds. They're called uh, Raycon. I was using them last night. They are absolutely terrific. They're so comfortable. Uh, they they kind of dampen sound the way the most popular earbuds do not. Uh, they don't look like a, you're an insect, which I appreciate, although I was using them in bed, so only my wife would have said, my God, there's an insect in bed. But Raycon earbuds start at about half the price of any other premium wireless earbuds on the market, and they sound just as ama- amazing as other top audio brands. Their newest model is the Everyday E25 earbuds, which I have, and they're just terrific. They're the best ones yet with six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, and a more compact design that gives you a nice noise-isolating fit. I really appreciate that that the noise isolating because I use them when I'm hiking a lot too and it blocks the wind. Now's the time to get the latest and greatest from Raycon. Get 15% off your order at buyraycon.com slash Clavin. That's buy as in B-U-Y raycon.com slash Clavin for 15% off Raycon wireless earbuds by raycon.com slash Clavin. And if you tap them three times, they tell you how to spell Clavin. I just made that up, but it's K-L-A-V-A-N. Speaking of Clavin, his mailbag, whoever he is, is tomorrow. You want to get your questions in. You can only get questions in if you are a subscriber. So go to dailywire.com and subscribe, then hit the podcast button, then hit the Andrew Clavin podcast, then hit the little mailbag symbol. You can ask me anything you want religion, politics, your personal life, all my answers guaranteed 100% correct and will change your life on occasion for the better or so I've heard most of the time. <laughs> um, never mind. But, but the thing is, if you want to send a video uh, question, please do. We love them, but keep them under a minute because we don't have time to, uh, um, to edit them. You know, speaking of Gerard Baker, who's no longer the editor-in-chief of the Wall Street Journal, he's now editor-at-large and writes a very, very good column called Free Expression. He was talking about this thing, about the truth, talking about the Chinese flu. And this has been one of the hardest things for me to cover because the numbers change. No one is reliable. No scientist is reliable. They say different things. The governors obviously have put out politicized lockdown orders bent on destroying religion, but letting people protest and riot. It is really hard to know the truth. And uh, Gerard Baker goes after them saying there are large uh, representations of this massive and complex story in the press that sh- we should mark as simply unforgivable. The notion, implicit or at times explicit, in so much of the reporting that the U.S. handling of the pandemic has been a globally unique failure, this is quickly ascribed to the ignorance and malevolence of the Clorox injecting quack cure peddling bozo in the White House. The death toll in the U.S. stands at around 500 per million people. That is significantly higher than in Germany or Japan, for example, but still some way below the U.K., Italy. Spain and several other European countries. And, you know, by the way, you know, each country is different. America has more black people. Black people are are dying more from the flu because they have more comorbidities. Uh, There's also states on the East Coast that have more deaths than entire countries. What if you lopped New York off? Then our death race would change. But he goes on to say even less forgivable is the naked, politically motivated, selective use and manipulation of data to damage Republicans and favor Democrats. In fact, It's literally opposite the case that Democrat uh, states have done better than Republicans. It's the other way around. It's worth noting that of the 10 states and the District of Columbia with the highest death rates, eight have Democratic governments. This is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the revenge of reality. We're going to talk about the fact that you have to, when you start lying, you have to lie more and more and more because reality will speak louder and louder and louder. And that is what is happening to the left. And that is what is happening to the press. And that is why they become utterly useless when they're not destructive. Now, the Me Too movement, which was very important right up until the minute Joe Biden was accused of digitally raping a coworker, and then it didn't matter. It claimed a lot of careers, claimed Harvey Weinstein, and there's been no movie about that. Lockhart Steele of Vox, no movie about that. Hamilton Fish, who ran the leftist New Republic, no movie about that. But Roger Ailes, two major films. Here's a couple of clips. Here's one from Bombshell. This is clip 11. This was the uh, theater film. 
have to adopt the mentality of an Irish street cop. The world is a bad place. People are lazy morons. Minorities are criminals. Sex is sick but interesting. Ask yourself what would scare my grandmother or piss off my grandfather. And that's a Fox story. Oh, it makes so much sense. So that's that's Fox News as depicted in the theatrical release Bombshell. Here's the HBO version of the Roger Ailes story. Remember, two stories about Roger Ailes, who was accused but never convicted, never proved to be a uh, sexual harasser. This is the loudest voice from HBO, cut 12. Television is the most powerful force in the world. We're going to give them a vision of the world the way it really is. way they want it to be. If we can do that, then they will never change the channel. People don't want to be informed. They want to feel informed. <laughs> so that, I said HBO, that's Showtime, the loudest voice. That's the version of Roger Ailes that Hollywood rushed, rushed to put in front of you. Here is the version in the Man in the Arena, which is now available on Amazon Prime and other places. Here is a little trailer of this. And this is a real, this is the real Roger Ailes documentary footage with recorded interviews. Cut 13. I tend to think of it as something I've done, which my critics would not have done. If I were to pick the most consequential conservative of the modern era, it would be Roger Ailes. And so he engineers presidencies. And then he engineers the most successful news network ever. What Roger Ailes did was create somewhat of a miracle, and it's called Fox News. He was one of the most creative people anywhere in America in the news business. Love to sort of be the agitator. Roger, you are, face it, I mean, to Democrats, you're a good villain. I'm a 28-year-old former ditch digger from Ohio, and they're asking me to produce television for a presidential campaign. Roger Ailes is on your team, you win. So Michael Barnes is the writer and director of The Man in the Arena, which uh, is, like I said, it is a new level of documentary for uh, conservative filmmaking. Michael, it's good to have you on. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Andrew. Good to see you. You were the only person, the first person who said to me, who the first person who uh, could explain himself, who said to me that Trump was going to win. So I'm going to ask you at the end of this interview who's going to win the next election. So Fair get enough. your prediction ready. Why did you why did you take this on? This was a hard project. Why did you take this on? You know, good good question. Um, I, I knew Roger tangentially, um, and you know, talked to him a bit after the downfall. And as I saw what was lining up in Hollywood of these films that you just highlighted that were coming out, it was like a, a football game where one team wasn't allowed to show up. We know what that score is going to be. It's going to be two hundred to zero. And you could just see a 200 to zero game coming because one team wasn't going to be there. It's like a prosecutor without a defense, a defense without a prosecutor. So I, that caused me to um, look into it a little bit for, further. And then I realized what an extraordinary life and influence he had been. But that was what set the hook initially was knowing what was coming and then doing a little research and realizing that, boy, if you put two teams on the field, it's going to be a far different ball game. Ailes, I mean, when I watched this documentary, I have to say, I did not know that Ailes was involved in so many uh, important hinge moments in politics. I mean, he really, it was not just creating Fox News. It was his whole career. You know, it, it, it's a terrible analogy to make. So, of course, I'll step right in it. It's almost <laughs> like a Forrest Gump film where you've got this yeah. hemophiliac guy who happened to have been brilliant and just a baller, as, you know, as uh, my guys say in the film, who just was again and again and again, decade after decade, in the rooms as a principal, as a causal agent. And most people don't know that. They only know that he started Fox News. He was in his mid-50s when he did that. That's, uh, yeah, I mean, it was like the, the fact that he was, that he helped George W. Bush win a debate, that when George W. Bush got rid of him, he lost the election. Uh, it was just, uh, again and again, he would pop up, like you said, like Forrest Gump at these major, major moments. It's a, it's a really good story. How hard was it to get this made? Was it tough? It was tough because uh, I thought it would be a small haystack and I'd find some needles. And as I began investigating, I realized the scope of his life and his story you know, I think we all would say, gosh, it should be a miniseries. 
you know, Showtime agrees with me. So um, that was the tough part is deciding what to put in. There are a bunch of constituencies because how you tell the Roger Ailes story and what context you tell it in, you know, some people aren't going to be happy with you and other people want uh, this thing, uh, this aspect accent, uh, accentuated. Other people want this played down. That was the hard part was the timing, putting it in a theatrical length and satisfying the very different groups that I was hoping would watch the film. You know, the, the big thing, uh, people who don't work in Hollywood don't know this, but it's, 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 it's easier to get a picture made than it is to get it distributed. How did you get it out, and, and, and how do people find it? Yeah, uh, the best way is go to manintheArena.com, and we have the digital platforms there. It's on, you know, we released it on Amazon to start. I think iTunes is joining this week. And the various platforms, um, but it's so this is digitally released. Maninthearena.com is where you get it. You can one-click punch right through it. Um, that's the best way. That, it, it's interesting. So you actually set up a website where people. I, I mean, is this is this the way we're going to break through? Do you think is this the is this going to be uh, a new way of getting through Hollywood without having to go through distributors, theaters, and the rest? Yes, yeah. Andrew, I'll, I'll make the big reveal on your show, and that is about six months to a year ago, the filters that existed on digital platforms went away. You can upload your family videos today and sell them on Amazon as a movie. And no mm. one's going to block you so long as you've QC. Once that word gets out to fair and balanced filmmakers that you no longer need to seek permission of a gatekeeper to be on digital platforms, no more excuses. Let's make Not films. It. And have, we have an audience, but now you get to compete head to head, granted with billion dollar conglomerates, but at least you get to be on the field. And that was not That's, the case a year ago. That is big news. That is real. I did not know that. And that is really, really interesting. That could truly change the game until they find the loophole and try to cl close it up. They, All right. I'm, they, I, got a, <laughs> I got a minute left. Who's going to win the election? Uh, Andrew, it's the same conversation you and I had in the summer of 2016. It's too close to call, okay. um, but realize we are at peak Biden right now. Um, okay. The campaign of the president is now going to turn and start focusing on Biden the same way Trump focused on Hillary in the summer. It's too close to call, but the, that that's what I'll say. <laughs> OK, OK. But you think this is Biden's peak moment? There's not a single other Biden vote to be harvested. <laughs> if this is Biden at his peak, I think we're the guy is in <laughs> big trouble. Michael Barnes, the writer and director of The Man in the Arena about Roger Ailes, please go on and watch it. It is a genuinely, I'm not kidding, it is genuinely a new level of uh, conservative filmmaking. It's great talking to you, Michael. I hope to get to see you soon. Thanks. You're the best, Andrew. See you All next right. time. Right. Um, let us talk about other good things like Ring. Ring will keep your home secure. Ring is on a mission to make neighborhoods safer. They've got home security products that are designed to give you peace of mind around the clock. Video doorbells, security cameras, smart security lighting, and alarm systems. Ring has everything you need to make sure your family and belongings are safe and secure anytime, anywhere. And with the all-new Ring Video Doorbell 3, you can keep an even closer eye on things than ever before. Video doorbells let you answer the door and check in on your home anytime. That's great when you're traveling, but it's also great when you're home, especially late at night. You don't have to get out of bed. Keep an eye on your doorstep where there are all these de deliveries that people are just <laughs> ripping off uh, or speak to delivery people when you can't come to the door. Get a special offer on the Ring Welcome Kit when you go to ring.com slash Clavin. The Welcome Kit includes the Ring Video Doorbell 3 and Chime Pro. It's all you need to start building custom security for your home today. Just go to ring.com slash Clavin. That's ring.com slash Clavin. If anyone comes to your door that you don't recognize, ask him how to spell Clavin. And if he says K-L-A-V-A-N, call the police because he knows who I am. <laughs> he knows who I am. You don't want him anywhere near your house. All right. You know, if we're talking about reality versus these lies. These lies, they, they rate the lies go around the world. I think it was Mark Twain said they go around the world before the truth gets its pants on. But now that is an actual uh, conspiracy. It is a, a conspiracy to keep 
reality from getting into your mind. But reality keeps speaking, so you have to keep silencing reality. You have to get more and more oppressive. And that's where the left always goes down. It always goes down that path because their systems don't work, because their systems are immoral, because their systems make people miserable. They have to keep telling you that what's happening isn't what's happening. And now that is coming to uh, pass in both Seattle, in Seattle, in Portland, in Chicago. Uh, In Seattle, the police chief, Carmen Best, is resigning uh, after they defunded the police and threatened her with a a large salary cut. Uh, This is a, you know, Seattle is a mostly white city. I I think it's 70 to 75 percent white. This is a black female leader who was supported by the rank and file. She's walking out Uh, in Chicago. You know, remember when the riots and lootings happened in Minneapolis after uh, the death of George Floyd. I always have to pause before I say George Floyd because I think of the Prime Minister Lloyd George. Uh, But after the death of George Floyd, there was the riots and looting in Minneapolis. And Donald Trump said, this is looting. And when the looting starts, the shooting starts. This is the mayor of Chicago, Lori Lightfoot's reaction to what Donald Trump said. This is cut 18 at the time. His goal is to polarize, to destabilize local government and inflame racist urges. And we can absolutely not let him prevail. And I will code what I really want to say to Donald Trump. It's two words. It begins with F and it ends with U. Now, that's a tough code, but people who voted for Lori Lightfoot might just be able to figure that one out. So this is what she said yesterday after her city, the luxurious shopping district of her city, was utterly trashed by violent looters after a an armed gunman was shot in a running gun battle with the police. It was just lucky it wasn't the police who got shot. It was the bad guy. And that started the rioting, the looting. This is cut five. These individuals engaged when it can only be described as brazen and extensive criminal looting and destruction. And to be clear, this had nothing to do with legitimate, protected First Amendment um, expression. What occurred in our downtown and surrounding communities was abject criminal behavior, pure and simple. And there cannot be any excuse for it, period. This is not legitimate First Amendment uh, protected speech. These were not poor people engaged in petty theft to feed themselves and their families. This was straight up felony criminal conduct. So those teeth in your ass, Madam Mayor, are are the teeth of reality biting you. I mean, what what's what's the difference between what happened in in Minneapolis and what happened in Chicago? There is not. You know, here's what here's what a Black Lives Matter uh, leader said about the looting. This is Ariel Atkins, a BLM organizer, according to NBC Chicago, uh, said, I don't care if someone decides to loot a Gucci or a Macy's or a Nike store because that makes sure that person eats. This is reparations. Anything they want to take, they can take it because these businesses have insurance. So in other words, the same BLM people who were rioting in Minneapolis when Trump called them rioters are the same people rioting in your city when you call them rioters. It, it's true. It is true that the death of George Floyd looks much worse than obviously the death of an armed gunman. And we don't know exactly what happened yet. A new video has come out. It throws some doubt on it. It looked, it looked, still looks to me like reckless policing, but still, and, and cruel policing, but still, still just because uh, something like that happens, just because an injustice happens, doesn't give people the right to loot and riot and terrorize the rest of the citizenry who, after all, had nothing to do with it. It had nothing to do with it. And, you know, the thing is, the aldermans in uh, Chicago, they have this system where they have ward wards and they have aldermans in each ward. They know what's going on. They've been trying to complain to Lightfoot forever. Here's Anthony Beal of the Ninth Ward. The city is in total unrest. Uh, In my opinion, I think the mayor has lost the confidence and the control of this city. Um, You know, she's listening to the wrong people and the wrong people are the ones that's really, um, you know, leading this unrest in the city of Chicago. You know, the aldermen are the ones that are elected by their constituency, and there's a total disregard of listening to the aldermen who know the pulse of this city, know the pulse of their ward. So this is the same mayor, by the way. Remember when she was told by uh, Chicago alderman Raymond Lopez uh, that this was he was worried that local you can't rely on local church congregations to keep the peace between rioters and the police. And she said, you're full of S and they started cursing at one another. She has not been listening. She has not been listening to her alderman, who are actually the people 
running the, se- the sections of the city. This woman is with Bill de Blasio, two of the worst mayors in the galaxy. There are planets, seriously, there are planets watching us from a distance going, hey, I don't know, I've never seen a mayor that bad. They really, these are terrible, terrible mayors. And mayors, you know, mayors have a responsibility. They're supposed to fill up the potholes. They're supposed to make sure the subways run. They're supposed to make sure the garbage is picked up. This is what they're supposed to do. If you are not controlling the rioters in your town, you are a bad mayor. And so the thing is, in, in Portland, where they were blaming federal agents for the tear gassing going on. Now they have riots and now things are being set on fire. Set up, buildings are being set on fire with people inside, which is just attempted murder. And now here's the thing, a cl- classic reactions. These are the things I love. I, one of the reasons I love talking about politics is because the absurd makes me laugh. This is one of the things that is probably one of my ugliest characters. This is a character trait I'm going to have to explain to God at the last day. I'm going to have to say, yes, I was laughing at that abject corruption that was destroying the country. Something about it just cracks me up. What I love is when confronted with reality, it really is like um, the mentally ill. The mentally ill are just like this. When they're confronted with reality, the villain becomes the person confronting them with reality, not the fact that they were wrong. You know, if you tell people, no, Martians are not speaking to you through your teeth, it's like, you know, you just don't understand what the reality. So here is Lori Lightfoot now being asked if maybe, perhaps, her lenient attitude toward violence before has led to an escalation in the rioting. This is cut 16. It, it almost sounds as though you're saying this is the reason we have it is because the courts and the prosecutors were not doing their job, that they were going too easy on the looters from the last time around. Is, uh, am no, I don't take you? it from me. Greg, let's be clear. I mean, and don't bait us, okay? No, I, I this just, is, no, no. I, don't, I don't, do not bait us. Don't, do not bait us. This is a serious situation. People are concerned about their safety. <laughs> don't bait us. Don't bait us. You know, remember when Donald Trump would say to these guys, you're fake news. The new, This is not the news. The things you're saying to me aren't happening when he was right. And they said, oh, this is, this is a terrible threat to the First Amendment. It's a threat to the First Amendment. This is not not like a, an unserious thing, like telling people they can't go to church, but telling other people they can riot because you like what the rioters are saying, but you don't like the pe- the person that the people in church are praying to. That's you know that's not a threat to the First Amendment. But telling fake news people like Brian Stelter and Jim, uh, look at me, I'm Jim Acosta over at CNN, telling them that they're fake news when they're fake news, that's a threat to the First Amendment. I love that. Don't bait me by asking me a hard question. Just like Nancy Pelosi said the other day to Judy Woodruff, a liberal reporter, if you ask me a tough question, you're basically uh, playing for the other team. You're playing for the other team. So as reality bites back, as reality takes its revenge, as reality speaks up, which it always does, the gods of the copybook heading always come back with fire and fury and slaughter. When that happens, they just have nothing to say anymore except shut up and shut up. And you remember all of this, you know, the guy in uh, Chicago, the police chief in Chicago, James Craig, points out the fact that so many of these things, so many of these riots, and this has been true since the 60s, start with a lie. They start with a lie about the police killing in the first place. This is cut 17. One of the things that we saw here in Detroit, almost eerily similar to what happened last night in Chicago, a false narrative was perpetrated by these criminals very quickly and indicated that a unarmed team was shot and then called for people to come downtown to loot. The one similarity is that the criminals tried to do the same thing here in Detroit about three weeks ago when our officers were fired upon and we ended up using deadly force. They put out a false narrative that we shot an unarmed African-American man seated on his porch. Totally false. So that, I said that was Chicago. That's Detroit. He was talking about Detroit. But, but this is the thing. You know, the same thing has been true of almost all of these killings is we don't get the full information. And sometimes they're a bad killing, but it's very rare. It's very, ra- very, very rare that it's just some racist guy going, I'm going to kill you because you're black. It's always some kind of discrepancy. I mean, even with George Floyd, the guy was full of drugs. He was resisting arrest. We don't know the full story yet, and we won't until the trial. But it's always like this. You never have the right to riot. Never. Do you have the right to riot and loot unless you're starting a revolution? In that case, the administration has the right to fight back. All right. Let us talk a little bit more talking about reality. Let's talk about rockauto.com. And of course, our favorite thing about rockauto.com is getting to say 
rockauto.com. But that shouldn't be your favorite thing about saying rockauto.com. Your favorite thing should be not only do I get to say rockauto.com, but I get to shop for car parts right in my computer at prices you can afford. And, and you also get to say rockauto.com and you get to say it at home so your wife can hear you and it sounds really cool. Rockauto.com always offers the lowest prices possible rather than changing prices based on what the market will bear. They have lots and lots of choices. If you happen to need a Delphi FG1456 fuel pump assembly, which I was just saying to myself, you know what I need? I need a Delta FG. I the Honda Odyssey for a 2005-2010 Honda Odyssey, and it costs $350 at a big chain store. You can go on uh, your computer and just say, I have no idea what I'm talking about, but give me that thing that I need at rockauto.com. Rockauto.com always has low prices, always has a great selection, and it's always right there in your computer so you don't have to drive there because your car is not running. Anyway, go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Write Clavin in there. How did you hear about us box so they know we sent you? And then write Clavin in the how do you spell Clavin box uh, so they know you know how to spell Clavin because it's K-L-A-V. A N. Also, you're going to have to subscribe to be in the uh, mailbag tomorrow. And you want to be in the mailbag because you don't want to have problems anymore. And I will solve all your problems tomorrow. So you want to subscribe at dailywire.com. But while you're subscribing, why not subscribe at the highest level, the all access level, where you get to join all access live, our exclusive live stream Q and A's hosted every night by each of the hosts, including me. All access membership also features exclusive access to live online discussions with our host writers and special guests. You also get not one, but two leftist tiers tumblers in case the election goes our way. You're going to need them as well as early and sometimes exclusive access to new Daily Wire products. So head over to dailywire.com slash Clavin right now to get 20% off all access with coupon code access. That's dailywire.com slash Clavin coupon code access to get 20% off. Plus you can be in the mailbag. So all your problems will be solved tomorrow. You know, I think it was uh, David Mamet who said in, in one of his movies, he had the line, um, everybody needs money. That's why they call it money. But and of course, there are a lot of reasons to love money. But one of the reasons I think conservatives love money is that money is also reality. Money is a good way, as Stephen King said, it's a way of keeping score. Uh, it's also a way you know, I'm not sure what you're keeping score of, but it's also a way of telling whether things work. You know, whenever I talk to college students and they say, I want to go into nonprofit, I think nonprofit is something that people don't want. That's why you don't make a profit with nonprofits. And so profit is giving people something they want. It may be something useless like a pet rock, but it's still something that people want. That's why you make a profit. And money is a really good way of telling what's going on and who and how cities are being run and how the country is being run. You know, this is why I'm not a big fan of all this printing money without any kind of standard, because eventually that's going to come due. You can't just fantasize money. It will work for a while, but it will not work forever. Now, Andrew Cuomo, who is still one of these popular, the popular governor of New York, who has handled the Chinese flu crisis worse than any other governor. I mean, this is a guy... <laughs> Truly, something something like 6,600 old people died. 6,600 old people died because Andrew Cuomo mandated that they sh that old people's homes should take in Chinese flu patients. He mandated that. He said they couldn't turn them away, and of course, it spread the infection. And old people are the people most vulnerable to the flu, and so at least 6,600. Now they're saying it may have been thousands more. It may have been thousands more than 6,600 because they didn't count those people who were taken from the, uh, the, old, the nursing homes to hospitals and died there. So it may have been even thousands more. Now when he was at, just to show you that this is not the most honest guy in America, you know, maybe a little bit more honest than Muggsy the thug in, you know, uh, in Gray Bar prison somewhere, but, but not an honest guy. When he was asked if there should be an investigation, he said, no, 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 that is a purely political thing. This is cut six. I wouldn't do an investigation as to whether or not it's political. Everybody can make that decision for themselves. Just look at where it comes from and look at the sources and look at their political affiliation and look at who wrote the letter in Congress and look at what publications raise it and what media outward <laughs> networks raise it. It's kind of uh, incredible. 
But but he did swear he was going to spend the rest of his life searching for the real killer of the old people. It's going to be like a TV series. It's like Andrew Cuomo and OJ are going to search for the real killers that the news media just somehow can't seem to find. Uh, but he is honest. He is honest when he has to be, Andrew Cuomo. And he, one of the reasons he has to be is because of money. And money is a way that reality bites back, okay? You know, uh, Bill, Bill McGurn, uh, the great McGurn, uh, writes a column in the Wall Street Journal as well, has a column today called Who Needs Billionaires? And he says, uh, Representative Alexandria Casio cortez has a demand for Governor Andrew Cuomo in a new video. The progressive Democrat from Queens says it's time to stop protecting billionaires and pass a billionaire tax, right? So, that Andrew Cuomo is not that uh, happy with that because Andrew Cuomo is, in fact, the executive of a state and he knows what executives know. And he says this. He says a single percent of New York's population pays 50 percent of the taxes and they're the most mobile people on the globe. This is what conservatives have been saying for a long time. If you tax rich people, they will leave. They can leave. They'll stay around for a while. They'll stay around in California because the sun is nice. It's, it's very beautiful here. But after a while, you know, they're not going to stay forever. He is basically begging them to come home. This is Cuomo begging the rich people who have left the city. They've left the city because of the crime. They've left the city because of the rioting. They've left the city because the services are so lousy under de Blasio. They've gone out to, the, to Long Island. They've gone out to Connecticut. And this is uh, Andrew Cuomo begging them to come back. I literally talk to people all day long who are now in the Hamptons house, who also lived here, or in their Hudson Valley house, or in their Connecticut weekend house. And I say, you got to come back. When are you coming back? We'll go to dinner. I'll buy you a drink, come over, I'll cook. They're not coming back right now. And you know what else they're thinking? If I stay there, they pay a lower income tax because they don't pay the New York City surcharge. <laughs> so this is the thing about lying, okay? This is how this works. When the Soviet Union basically said, now we're going, everything's going to be wonderful. Everything is going to be run by the state. There's not going to be any competition. It's all going to be state-owned. All This is what real socialism is, by the way. Socialism is not a welfare state. Almost all capitalist states, as they get older, develop a welfare state. Socialism is when the state owns the means of production so that there's no competition and there's nobody to say, you know, you're doing this wrong. We can do it better. I'm going to beat you out. That doesn't happen. It just, and, and everything goes down the drain. People who can leave start to leave. So what do they do? They start to build walls. And they're not Trump walls that keep people out because they want so much to get in. They're Berlin walls that keep people in because they want so much to get out. As reality captures up with you, people become a problem. People who see can see with their eyes, they know with their minds, they feel with their hearts what the truth is. And as the lies go down the drain and as reality catches up with you, people become a problem. I mean, almost every leftist theory, almost every leftist idea is if we could just get rid of the people, everything will be fine. If we can just convince the people that men are women, then men will be women. If we can just convince the people that riots are mostly peaceful, then our cities will be running great. If we can just convince the people that having homeless people defecate on your sidewalk outside the piece of property you paid a million dollars for is absolute paradise, they'll stop moving away. And if they won't stop moving away, maybe we can build a wall to keep them in. This is how socialism, Marxism, every system that doesn't work, this is how they progress. Because reality catches up with you and people become a problem. So, Andrew Cuomo, who's a, an executive of a state, and you'll find this, that executives of states are usually a lot more realistic than mayors because they're actually looking over a bigger uh, field of play and they actually have to deal uh, with certain problems that mayors don't have to deal with. This is as opposed to an actual communist, Bill de Blasio, the mayor of New York, who is with Lori Lightfoot, one of the two worst mayors in the galaxy, right? This is not just on Earth. This is in the entire galaxy, not just in the solar system. This is in galaxy where there are lots of other planets with populations. These are the two worst mayors. Bill de Blasio says, rich people, I don't need no stinking rich people. This is de Blasio. To the point about the folks out in the Hamptons, I have to be very clear about this. We do not make decisions based on the wealthy few. Uh, that I was, I was troubled to hear this concept that because wealthy people have uh, a set of concerns about the city, 
that we should accommodate them, that we should build our policies and approaches around them. That's not how it works around here anymore. This city is for New Yorkers. This city is for people who live here, work here, fight to make this place better, fight through this crisis. So there's a lot of New Yorkers who are wealthy, who are true believers in New York City and will stand and fight with us. And there's some who may be fair weather friends. <laughs> I love, I, you know, you got to love communists, socialists, whatever they call them these days. You got to love them because they, they never change. It's like Bernie, you know, Bernie, it, do, it doesn't matter. My favorite moment in uh, Bernie Sanders campaign, and I can't remember which venue he was on, CNN or Fox, was when he said, you know, I'm not talking about communism like the Soviet Union. I'm talking like uh, the, the kind of socialism uh, they have in, uh, in Scandinavia. I think he named a country. Maybe it was Denmark. Uh, and, and the interviewer said, but they don't have socialism there. They tried it and it didn't work. And he said, well, I'm not an expert on those economies. So I, you know, so I thought, well, if those are the economies you want this economy to be like, and you don't know anything about them, what are you talking? You know, what, what words are coming out of your mouth? Why are you even say, saying these things? It doesn't matter to an ideologue. It doesn't matter to an ideologue. And this is the way it progresses all the time. Lies, 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 or delusion, delusion. I really think at this point it is a delusion. And I really do. And this is only a theory. I can't prove it. I really do believe that the great shock, the great trauma is the fall of the Soviet Union. Remember, this was the place where they said, I've seen the future and it works. The Soviet Union, it was going to be paradise. And it didn't work. And that's a whole generation of intellectuals who wasted their lives. And the people who believed that went into our universities and they taught our children. And they taught our children, no, 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 it didn't fail. It didn't fail. It, you know, it's, read Howard Zinn. It was America's fault. The Cold War was America's fault. Read communist Howard Zinn. And these kids come out schooled on those lies that are the failure uh, to face reality. And as long as you don't face reality, reality will bite back. And when it bites back, people become a problem and you've got to silence them. And if that doesn't work, you got to wall them off. And if that doesn't work, then you got to do what communists do everywhere they take power, which is you got to wipe them out. And that's the progression because lies, <laughs> lies have uh, consequences. Lies have consequences and the truth always bites back. All right. Just a, a final reflection. Uh, yesterday, I talked about that Cardi B WAP song, that filthy uh, song. It was just terrible. I mean, you know, everybody's complaining about how filthy it is. It's just bad. But I have to say, I have to admit that Ben Shapiro was funnier than I was. He actually read the lyrics, blanking out all the dirty words, which is every other word. And he was genuinely funny about it because just watching Shapiro rap was worth the price of admission. And if, if I had done it, I'm, I, I have so much soul and so much rhythm and so much, you know, uh, there's such so much heart. It wouldn't have even been funny. It would have been, wow, that guy's really good. But when Shapiro does it, it's it's just hilarious. So he was trending on Twitter. And I was looking at some of the people. And, you know, when a conservative trends, it's all people attacking him. Uh, I was watching Ben get attacked for uh, talking about this thing. And what they all said, what they all said was, you know, with all the serious problems with Trump, orange man, bad, doing such terrible things. Why are you talking about a rap song? Why are you talk talking about this crappy rap song? That's the point I was making at the beginning, these little things, as the old song goes, these little things mean a lot. When language is twisted, when the human person is misrepresented, when culture is taken over, it's always little things. I remember right-wing intellectuals attacking Donald Trump when he started to attack the football players who were disrespecting the flag. And I said, Trump is right. This is where the culture takes place. Culture takes place in sentences. It takes place in words. It takes place in phrases. It takes place in gestures. It takes place in songs. Never let the left tell you you're being petty. Never let them tell you that you shouldn't speak up about their toxic culture because it is a toxic culture. It turns people in to meet puppets. And the consequences of that are very serious indeed, or much bigger uh, than the small thing you might be talking about at the moment. I got to stop there. The mailbag is tomorrow. Kiss your problems. Goodbye. They will be gone on The Andrew Clavin Show. I'm Andrew Clavin. The Andrew Clavin Show is produced by Robert Sterling. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Technical producer, Austin Stevens. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Assistant director is Pavel Wadowski, edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio mixed by Robin Fenderson. Hair and makeup, or head and makeup, by Nika Geneva. Animations are by Cynthia Angulo. Production assistants, McKenna Waters and Ryan Love. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire, 2020. You know, the Matt Wall Show, it's not just another show about, about politics. I think there are enough of those 
already out there. We talk about culture because culture drives politics and it drives everything else. So my main focuses are life, family, faith. Those are fundamental and that's what this show is about. I hope you'll give it a listen.